Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Wabandato and I am a program officer at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. Uh, the foundation began offering these town hall question and answer sessions on various topics back in uh, May, April, May, June, and it has been successful. We try to address topics of interest to Indian landowners, bringing in experts or others who have familiarity with the issues. Uh, this month, we are going to be addressing the valuation part of the rights of way. Uh, last week, my colleague Nicholas Emmons had a webinar that you would be able to review and that deals with negotiation of rights of way. Uh, previous sessions of our town hall can be found on the ILTF website as new resource entries beginning this week. Uh, they will be under the topic of interest. For example, last month we did probate and uh, you can find that probate town hall and the questions and answers under that particular section. Uh, the comments section we have tonight will be monitored and recorded. And so if we're unable to get to your answers today, we will work to get those. Tonight we have with us uh, two specific panelists, our two guests, as it were. Uh, Gregory Powell is with the, ah, I'm so used to saying AVSO, the um, appraisal valuation and uh, services office. Correct, appraisal and valuation services office. Uh, and he is joining us once again. He was with us a couple of months ago when we did appraisals. Uh, later add to our panel this evening is uh, Chad Lindsay. He is with the Center for Applied Research. Uh, and again, before having them introduce themselves, this is a town hall approach to our conversation as such. I have questions already lined up, but if uh, you have your own questions, post them in the comment section and I can get them added as well. Uh, so please go ahead, uh, Greg, if you might introduce yourself. Certainly, thank you very much, Jim, for the opportunity to be here again. Um, my name is Greg Powell. I'm the Regional Supervisory Appraiser for um, the Appraisal and Valuation Services Office. It, the Indian Trust Property Valuation Division and then particularly the southwest part of the country. I, I uh, work predominantly with the Pacific region, the western region, the Navajo group, and then the southwest region of BIA. Those are my primary clients. Um, we do appraisals obviously for, um, as you folks should be very aware, for whatever needs that, that arise and make their way to the BIA. Uh, BIA presents those requests to us for appraisal and or review, and we process them as quickly as we can. Um, looking forward to, to hearing what questions both Jim that you have as well as the audience might have for us tonight regarding rights of way. Um, it's a very interesting topic. There's a broad uh, realm of different types of rights of way that we can talk about, and um, each one is unique and um, special in its own way. So looking forward to hearing what uh, questions come up. Wonderful. And just as a reminder, uh, for the recording purposes, I'm using speaker view. And as Greg is using my cell phone, uh, you'll be looking at me. And that may explain why my mouth is not moving with the words. Uh, I know that can be a little disconcerting. Our other guest tonight is Chad Lindsay. If you take a few minutes or a minute or two. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, <clears throat> my name is Chad Lindsay, as Jim just mentioned. I'm an economist at the Center for Applied Research, which is a pretty small economic consulting firm headquartered currently in, in Denver. Um, we, we do a variety of things in Indian country related to economics, but predominantly, I guess, these days, our work focuses on valuing rights of way and sort of the whole approach to the right of way process for, for Indian tribes. Um, you know, we do start to finish, we assist the tribes at the beginning of the, of the process, as well as performing the valuation part um, as, and then help with the, the documentation side at the end. So that, that's, that's where we're coming from and, and that's what I do predominantly. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I usually like to begin these with um, some basic 
answers to help people get a grounding in what we're going to cover. Uh, would either of you like to take a stab at the difference between what a right-of-way is and an easement? Uh, those two terms get thrown around quite a bit. Okay. So with, yeah, within, um, within the Code of Federal Regulations, which um, guides the work that we do within ABSO, um, they're essentially synonymous. They are different within the industry, but from a, a Code of Federal Regulation standpoint, and, um, they're essentially synonymous. The idea being that um, the, um, th there an encumbrance on the rights that the landowner has to the land, and, and those rights get encumbered in some way, um, for a specific use, um, and, and that use is limited. So from strictly from the CFR standpoint, they're, they're virtually synonymous, um, from a practical standpoint, there are, there are some other differences, but, um, since my work dealt strictly into the CFR realm, um, I'll not get into those differences. Sure. Earlier, I was kind of commenting that it reminds me of uh, rectangles and squares. A square is a rectangle, but not all rectangles are squares. In this sense, rights of way are an easement, but not all easements are considered rights of way. And so that's probably the, the main thing. It's a specific right to use another's property, whereas a right of way, you kind of think of it as traveling across that right over time. Uh, next question I have is, um, is there money to be had from all rights of way? I think when we talk about the topic of rights of way, a lot of landowners and even tribal members think, oh, somebody's coming across our property. That's going to be a big windfall. But is there always going to be money that comes out of these things? Each right of way has some value um is it a monetary value maybe maybe not um and the reason that i say that is in some cases a service line which is also a, a type of a right of way or a type of an easement um, a service line that is extended across your property for the neighbor's house um, quite frequently might have no monetary value to you as the landowner. You might want to extend that as a courtesy. Um, conversely, a high uh, voltage transmission line running across your property may have significant value. And so uh, largely it depends upon um, the nature of the right of way and, and what its use is and ultimately what the value of the rights that are being encumbered are. Um, uh, another example is uh, we are, are working with an applicant right now that wants to get a mineral on development right of way um, across some Indian land. Um, there's no mineral activity in the area, so the mineral rights um, have very little value, um, and so what is what are the rights that are being impacted? Um, they're being asked to agree not to develop any minerals for the next 50 years, but currently there's no uh, minerals known on the property that have any economic value. So what is the value of that? It, it's probably very low. So it, it depends ultimately, and that, that's kind of the standard appraisal valuation type um, answer is it, it depends on the nature of the right of way. Okay. I've had a couple of questions uh, that were surrounding the rights as allotment owners. I know we're primarily dealing with the valuation process. Uh, for instance, uh, the registrant talked about having uh, San Diego gas and electric poles on their property, and the contracts are from the, seven, from the 70s. So um, is it common for some of those to be in perpetuity? Are they most often going to be um, of limited duration? I suppose it might depend on when those contracts were signed as well. 
Is that something either of you are familiar with? Yeah, I could touch on that a bit. <clears throat> I mean, especially with the older infrastructure, not necessarily San Diego gas and electric infrastructure, but infrastructure that was maybe originally constructed by Bureau of Reclamation or is now currently owned by Western Area Power Administration or some of those sort of pseudo public private entities. A lot of those entities do have perpetual rights of way across a lot of land, um, meaning that there is no term limit, there is no opportunity in the future to renegotiate those those rights of way. However, you know, most of the infrastructure that was constructed by either investor owned utilities or, you know, cooperatives or, you know, less less public entities. Um, generally, there are they are term limited agreements. Though I would say if they were if they're coming up for renewal these days, they were 50 plus year old or 50 plus year agreements. Um, so, you know, going forward, most most of our clients aren't negotiating nearly that long of a term. Um, they're they're, you know, advocating more for a 20 or 25 year term going forward. Um, but, you know, it, again, it, it kind of depends. But, yeah, it, if it's an investor owned utility, they there's not really any reason they should have. Uh, perpetual easement across a lot of lands, unless um, those allotted lands were, you know, at one point in time, you know, fee lands, which I guess doesn't technically happen, but on the tribal track side, it does. You know, oftentimes tribes will buy up uh, parcels of private lands within the, the original reservation boundaries and then reconvert it to trust. Um, and in which case, you know, that trust parcel might carry with it uh, the, the perpetual easement or grant of right of way um, that that the, the previous landowners had had negotiated. Yeah, in my experience, I, I would agree with what had, Chad has indicated. Um, additionally, I'm told by my BIA partners that I work with frequently that as as the the trustee. Um, the BIA is moving away from doing um, perpetual easements. Um, it would be very rare today to see a perpetual easement put in place. They want to try to limit those as much as possible. Um, the exceptions might be um, if, if um, federal highway funds are involved, um, something to that effect. Um, but generally speaking, easements are uh, temporary in nature anymore um historically there had been some but they're uh, becoming much more rare okay and can either of you comment on the typical timeline from start to finish on how long a right-of-way might take uh the questioner had said that they hear that there's a lengthy backlog uh, is there a plan to address that or fix it Um, the, the timing would vary by region, mm -hmm. um, as well as by the nature of the right of way that's involved. Um, I have heard, I have worked um, from a review standpoint on on some appraisals related to rights of way that have been fairly old you know in, in appraisal terms uh, meaning 18 months or 24 months old um, i don't know and i don't understand from my perspective why that's taking that long um there's there's no real reason for it that i know of um and and why it could be could be explained in any number of cases um it may be that the applicant um, has been trying to get hold of all of the the various landowners and in a highly fractionated allotment that um, is having difficult doing difficulty doing that and so from start to finish that entire process I have heard can take years just to get um, the signatures they need to complete an application to get it submitted to BIA for them to approve. Um, in other cases, it, it may be a function of, for whatever reason, BIA having a significant amount of backlog. Um, in some of the regions that we service, it may be a backlog of 
the work on our end um, due to staffing issues. Um, uh, there could be any number of reasons and, and they could lie with any number of sources, the applicant, the BIA with us, um, any place in between. Um, and so it's difficult to say uh, within my region, and, and particularly when I say that within Western region, um, I don't know how long it's been taking to get the application itself compiled. But once we get an appraisal from the BIA uh, with the request to review it, it, we usually get those third-party requests processed reviewed and approved, you know, after we work with the appraiser, if necessary, within 60 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, but that's only our small part of the process. And I, I really am not in a position to speak to either the applicant's process and how long that takes, um, nor am I in a position to speak accurately to the BIA's process and how long that piece may take. Well, thank you, Greg. Well, I, I can happily add on to that since, you know, I don't know what happens at the BIA, but I do know what happens on the application side. I mean, that's, that's the side of the equation that we're involved in. Um, and and I, I guess really, you know, it depends on how complicated the right of way is, as, as Gregory just mentioned, uh, you know, namely or chiefly whether or not we've got allotments involved at all, or if it's tribal trust lands exclusively where the tribe is handling all the negotiations. And I should say, you know, up front that my firm and I don't have any experience negotiating specifically and only for a lot these. Normally, the way we do a transaction is we work for the tribe and the tribe, you know, uses its leverage in negotiations or in the application process to to help the allottees get a, above, quote unquote, fair market value as well. So in that process, you know, there's the appraisal is just is one small piece of the equation. There's, you know, some sort of environmental compliance involved, which can take time. Um, you know, cultural resources need to be, you know, evaluated um, either internally if the tribe has something set up for that or externally. And then you've got, you know, the valuation piece, which, you know, the appraisal is part of the valuation on for allotted lands. It has to be uh, undertaken per the, the federal regulations. But the tribe may also, you know, decide to have their own opinion of value that is not necessarily based on uh, the quote unquote fair market value appraisal under use path standards. In which case, you know, that can take even longer if you're, if you're looking at variables that, you know, require you to look at, at, at um, in-depth things about the company that, that's seeking the right of way, then it can take longer, you know. Um, and then there's a negotiation process that ensues, and that negotiation process can take anywhere from, you know, six months to a year plus, depending on, you know, how, how much hardball the, the tribe wants to play and how amenable the, the right-of-way applicant is to, you know, reaching a negotiated value. Um, so that's part of the process. And then if there are allotments involved, as, as Greg mentioned, you know, there, there is a lengthy, potentially very lengthy process wherein, you know, the, the right-of-way applicant, either assisted by the tribe or not assisted by the tribe, does have to acquire consent, you know, 50 plus percent of the ownership interest in each allotment that's affected has to grant their consent. And, you know, there's there's time allowance there. Um, if you don't hit the 50 percent threshold for a single allotment, technically, you know, the right-of-way application is incomplete. And so you have, you have to keep going back the applicant has to keep going back and, and until they reach that consent threshold. And then once that's all together, then, you know, all those those pieces go into a single document that gets submitted to the BIA for approval. And then the approval process, I guess, by by technically shouldn't take more than 60 days, although, you know, it, it does sometimes. So, um, you know, and then in the middle there, there are some some tribal council requirements for consent that need to be met. And, and they want to be kept surprised. So, you know, I've never done a, a, a right of way that includes tribal and allotted land in less than a year. Um, typically, you know, some of them can take up to four or five years, to be honest. Okay. Oh, that's good information to have. Uh, as you've got into some of the value, both Greg and uh, Chad, I'd like to shift gears into the the monetary side a little bit harder. One of the questions that came up was to ask if uh, someone would 
well, I guess it would actually be Greg. If Greg would be able to address the uh, the directive that came from or to AVSO about right of ways, uh, specifically they mentioned that AVSO must be the named client, only AVSO as the client, scope of work. Um, I know you and I had spoken about that memo before. Could you talk a little bit about that for the audience? Yeah. Um, back in 2019, in June of 2019, the AVSO director at the time, a gentleman by the name of John Ross, um, sent a memo, an internal government memo to the director of BIA. Um, and, and basically, he outlined for the director of the BIA at the time the process by which we would um, engage in these third-party right-of-way valuation processes. Um, it involved, first of all, making sure that the correct interest that's being um, sought, the right of way, was accurately identified so that it could be accurately appraised. Um, then we made sure that the appraiser being um, hired by that applicant um, was properly qualified and credentialed. Um, and then beyond that, we got into the details, um, or the memo got into the details of what what does that fair market value mean? And and um, it cited the DFR and some of those kind of details. Um, more specifically, to answer your question about you know who is the client um, for those appraisals, AVSO is the client because in those regulations, those federal regulations, it identifies that the secretary has to be the one to approve um, certain things. And so we are named as the client so that we have the ability to act in the secretary's place um, for matters of valuation. And so that's why AVSO needs to be named as the client for a third party valuation um, on Indian land. Um, and can you quickly that, describe what oh, what it means to be a third party client as opposed to a standard appraisal report? Okay, a third party client is um, is defined in that memo as a non federal party payer for those services, and a non federal party could be the tribe. It could be you know, um, XYZ Gas and Electric, it could be at and it could be whomever. Um, it could be a, you know, we, we use the same format for business leases where the applicant is a non, uh, a non Indian seeking to get a business lease on, on Indian land. So it really just boils down to a non federal party that's paying for those services. Um, and they can't be the client for those services, AVSO has to be. And the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice gives allowance for the payer of the appraisal services to be different than the client for the appraisal services. And so that's what we rely on um, when we have our com communication with that appraiser that's working for that applicant. Um, beyond that, it went into details about you know what what can be expected in terms of a statement of work, and the statement of work is that document that we have to create that gives the appraiser instructions about how that appraisal needs to be conducted. Um, we make sure that they have the correct definition of fair market value that's used in um, 25 CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, that deals with um, rights of way across Indian lands. Beyond that, we get into issues of what is the property that's involved and what are the rights being appraised and what is the purpose of the right of way? What's the duration of it? Um, do those things affect the value? We, we ask the appraiser through this 
statement of work document to identify those things and address them to the best of their ability. Beyond that, then that statement of work goes on and it, it describes the, the um, appropriate methods that can be used to try to identify what the, the, the correct value is. Um, it could include other comparable transactions of similar rights of way. It could be, in some cases, um, market rent situations that have similar uses and restrictions on use. Rarely would it be a, a, a traditional before and after or, or some variation of that, like a state rule of and then even more rare would it be an across the fence um, appraisal methodology. Those two are specifically um, used for partial acquisitions um, like you would find off of Indian country, um, as well as for partial acquisitions by the federal government for things like a border wall or, or what have you that way. Um, those are the key things. Then we get into details specific about, you know, what what the appraisal itself needs to include. Um, that are are just technical things and really don't have much effect on the value, but are are technical representations that need to be correct. Um, so a, that's really kind of kind of what we provide. Okay. And as a quick follow up, um, in the old days. A lot of a lot of these would think that uh, the Office of Appraisal Services would be responsible for doing that on behalf of the federal government. Does AVSO do appraisal work for rights of ways any longer? It, rarely. M most commonly, the applicant is paying for that service now. Okay. Um, occasionally on, on small, like a service line agreement, um, small distribution lines, we may get involved, but generally speaking, the applicant is paying for those services now. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have Chad here is that uh, as we're getting into third party transactions and as we're looking at uh, going beyond specific appraisal reports, what are some of the alternative valuation methods? I know um, throughput is a term that gets thrown around quite a bit, but what are some of these alternatives that uh, tribal communities might be need to be aware of, perhaps? Yeah, all right. Um, well, I, I can touch on that. I, well, there are the, the methodologies that Greg just mentioned that, that use path uniform stance or standards of professional appraisal practices provide, you know, which are, are numerous. However, you know, in, in my experience, most appraisers don't really like to stray too far from the sales comparison approach when it comes to, to valuing tribal land. Um, and so, you know, one of the approaches that, that our firm does is, is akin to the sales comparison approach, except that instead of using comparables that, you know, represent private land transactions for rights of way, you know, we have in our own inventory transactions, inventory of comparable sales. We have transactions representing rights of way across tribal land that were negotiated where all parties involved, you know, knew about the, the specific regulations dictating, you know, essentially that condemn, condemnation does not apply and that any right of way compensation negotiated uh, between the tribe and the right of way applicant has, to, you know, the tribe has to give consent to that. So, you know, there's a different market there because the tribe has considerably more leverage in, in a lot of these utility corridors than your private, your average private landowner would. You know, they have much larger land parcels, plus they've got, you know, the fact that condemnation doesn't exist, plus, you know, just it, it, it's a different process entirely. So, you know, that is, that's one approach is, is kind of where we always start is, you know, essentially the sales comparison approach only we're using comparable sales that are representative of negotiated transactions. Um, to that, you know, we can do what I think most uh, appraisers would call the income approach, essentially figuring out how much 
uh, revenue is generated by the right-of-way applicant from the infrastructure that's on the ground uh, within the right-of-way. That, that can be very tricky when it comes to, you know, the transmission infrastructure, be it pipelines or overhead transmission lines or data service lines like fiber optic lines. Um, you know, you're on the reservation or on the allotted parcel, there's, there's only a, sm a small bit of, of infrastructure, but that is part of a very large system. And so in order to, to sort of, you know, produce what we call like a per mile, uh, per, per pipeline or per electric transmission line mile um, rate, you know, of revenue, it, it, it takes a little bit of, of sleuthing um, and it doesn't always work. Uh, it it kind of depends on how the system is, is constructed, whatever right of way you're valuing, the infrastructure has to be consistent or constructed in a certain way. You need to have, I mean, if, if you're likening the right of way to a, a toll road, you know, you have to have some way of measuring how many cars are going across. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to be able to, to, to match a rate to that. And so if, if the infrastructure is set up correctly and you're able to get that sort of data out of the right of way applicant, which can be tricky, especially for a lot of these, you know, if you've got a, a tribe with, with a decent caliber of lawyer, um, then, you know, that's, that's something that, that the tribe can get and, you know, share that information with the allottees. Um, so the income approach, you know, or the throughput based approach is, is what it's often referred to as, an, as another common metric. Um, another approach that, you know, we've seen that, that my firm specifically has seen, but never sort of engages in is what they call the, the build around approach or the reroute analysis, which is a real number, but uh, it's, it's not something we ever advocate for just because it, it sort of, it, it's confrontational, causes conflict, and, you know, it, it disrupts the relationship between the tribe and the Lattes, and uh, tribe of Lattes and the right of what applicant from the get-go. But essentially what it means is, you know, what, is it, what would it cost the, the entity involved, the, the right of what applicant to go around the parcel and then subtract a dollar and there's your value. Um, rebuilding this infrastructure can be incredibly costly for these applicants and plus the downtime for this infrastructure can be incredibly costly. You know, it's, it's, it's so it's, it's a big figure, you know, it's, the sky's the limit almost. Uh, but again, it's not something we advocate for and, and typically try to steer our clients away from it. But those are, those are kind of the, the three main approaches I've seen. I actually have experience with the build around. Um, we didn't have to get too brutal with it, but the tribal community I worked for a number of years ago, uh, they were putting fiber optic, they thought they were going to be able to piggyback onto an existing transmission line. And because it was a different purpose, fiber versus uh, standard telephone, uh, they did find out that they were gonna to have to negotiate explicitly with the tribe. And, and the tribe did very well in ensuring that they got fiber right into the tribal buildings at no cost, uh, rather than having the project have to go around the entire reservation and have to deal with the time delays uh, and missing federal uh, benchmarks and milestones in the process. So it, it can work, but it is, it's a difficult process to deal with for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. Just to, uh add one more comment to that. Um, if, if we are involved with the valuation um, for allotted lands, um, the Code of Federal Regulations restricts um, us to consider one of three methods, and that is an appraisal, a market analysis, or some other appropriate valuation method approved by the Secretary. Um, that's really the only thing that the, the Code of Federal Regulations allows us to do when we're dealing with allotted land. Um, the, the items that, that Chad was talking about, um, and, and in addition, I've, I've heard of tribes uh, just waiving the valuation altogether and going direct to negotiation. And that's fine. That's acceptable for the tribe. Unfortunately, that's not acceptable from the secretary's standpoint for individual allotted landowners. And in those cases, we've got to do either A, an appraisal, 
be a market analysis, which generally we interpret as some sort of market survey of those comparable easements that Chad mentioned, or some other appropriate valuation method. And, and that's determined you know, by the chief appraiser of ABSO on behalf of the secretary. And I'm taking, I'm gaining from this conversation that the reason the tribe can exercise that leverage has to do with their sovereignty. In other words, um, I believe Chad had mentioned much earlier that uh, the land could not be condemned. If I'm not mistaken, Chad, then uh, as individual landowners, it is possible that that land could be condemned and assumed for the right of way. I think that's technically true, although I've not ever seen it happen. I, I am aware of some recent case law that shows if there's any tribal interest whatsoever in the allotment, then, you know, it's it, essentially the, the tribe sovereignty applies to the entire allotment. So even if it's a fraction of a percent ownership by the tribe, you know, condemnation is not possible. That being said, you know, I, I've heard uh, that the allotments can be condemned, but I, I've not personally seen it. So. No, I haven't either. I think most of the time the process follows through. Uh, not all landowners are going to sign off on the documentation, but uh, the CFR and the regulations do not require an absolute 100% approval by landowners. Um, and in my experience, the tribe has the strongest voice. If the tribe is going to have it go through, it's going to be much, much more difficult for individuals to stop that process from happening. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, that's why it's so important that, that the tribe and the allottees sort of work together in these transactions, in my opinion. You know, if, the, if the tribe leaves the allottees out to do their own thing, oftentimes it doesn't go as well as if, you know, there's some cooperation, coordination between allottees and the tribe. So with that caveat then, Chad, what options or what can a landowner do to uh, either help or cause their tribal leadership to use the right kinds of resources to maybe uh, negotiate in their rights of way, at least put it to the advantage of the tribal community and the individuals? Because if I can't sit down at the table with the electric company or the, the fiber optic broadband company, how do I make sure that my tribal leadership knows what resources they can bring to that. Yeah, I, I don't know the specific answer to that question. I mean, I think, you know, it, it in my experience, it, it often comes down to, you know, obviously tribal leadership, but also to the tribe's general counsel in terms of legal counsel. You know, if you've got a pretty shrewd legal counsel in place, most tribes do have their own general counsel, either in-house or out-house. Um, if, 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 you know, if they're familiar with the regulations, um, whether they're, you know, adept at, at them or have, have, have gone through right-of-way transactions in the past is not really relevant, but as long as they're aware that there is a secondary process, you know, there is this, this whole effort that needs to take place, you know, it's pretty easy to get the tribe involved if, if, if you start there. Um, also, you know, mention it to the, the chairman, president, governor, depending on, on however your tribe's set up. I mean, it, there's, there's potentially quite a lot of money um, in, in these, these transactions. You know, it obviously is very much infrastructure specific. Um, you know, as, as Greg mentioned, you know, if it's the service line, there may not be any money in it whatsoever. And it, it's going to be hard to get the tribe to, you know, fork out money up front to pay for, you know, legal services or professional advisory services. Um, but if, if there is some, you know, if it is a valuable, valuable piece of infrastructure to the right of way applicant, then by all means, I mean, you know, don't, don't just let, let the applicant decide what the, the compensation should be. There, there should be some negotiation there. Okay. I did ask the audience, uh, that actually does bring through most of the questions I had. Uh, we had a very lively discussion during the full set of appraisals. Um, and so I was expecting a few more questions, but uh, in the interim till we get questions, are there other considerations, 
Greg, that uh, landowners and tribal leaders should be aware of in the valuation process for rights of way? Perhaps something I didn't address yet? Um, you, I, I think, you know, I think you've pretty much covered everything at this point, Jim. Um, I, the one thing would be just to keep in mind that that each different type of right of way that may be requested um, won't have the same value as every other type of right of way that gets requested. Um, each one is unique and each one is different. And, and you know, generally that's given and that's accepted, but occasionally I still hear about somebody protesting a value because it, you know, the value for, you know, this, um, distribution electric line is the same as the value on that um, data transmission line that is the backbone to you know AT&T or something to that effect so just keep that in mind mm -hmm. we assume that most people acknowledge that but every once in a while I, I think it gets lost um, beyond that if the landowner um, has information they think is relevant to the valuation, they need to speak up and make sure that the appraiser gets that information um, and ask the appraiser to consider that information. Um, not only is each right of way unique, but each property is unique. And, you know, what one property owner, you know, received may not indicate what the other property owner should receive. It may be more, it may be less because of the unique features on each property. So so that's also important. If you as the landowner believe your property has some unique feature that impacts the value of that right of way, make sure you speak up and ask that to be identified in the appraisal report. Um, and then go beyond that and, and reach out to the BIA and ask them to, to keep an eye on it um, ask to be able to communicate with the review appraiser that would be working for ABSO um, so that you can communicate those same concerns to them. Um, those kinds of things are important. We, we try to work as closely as we can with landowners, um, given the, the vast amount of fractionation that's difficult in some cases. Um, and impossible, frankly, in other cases, but we try to. And um, I know my peers around the country enjoy the opportunity to work with landowners. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be an important consideration uh, for people to understand too. Well, that's a good answer. Uh, in fact, one of the questions we had is that tonight's conversation talked quite a bit about the tribe working with the individuals to negotiate on behalf of its members as well as itself. And so the question said, if the tribe has not compacted the realty function from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, does BIA do any work to assist landowners? And I can say that for the most part, I'm not familiar with too many resources that the BIA provides to individual landowners. Um, I don't know if, if the two of you or have any, have a different answer. And so- no, that, that reflects my understanding and, and my own experience. And so the, and I, I guess I would assert then that uh, having as much knowledge as possible is the best weapon, the best resource that an individual landowner can bring to the process. Um, to my experience as well, uh, most rights of way are not going to generally cross only one parcel. And so uh, I don't think that landowners are generally going to be left high and dry. Uh, and in fact, actually with the land buyback program going through most or many allotted reservations, the tribe has been acquired, tribes have been acquiring interest in many, many allotments. So I think if you should find yourself at a disadvantage, it certainly is something where you could get some Buddy, to sell the tribe a minor parcel in that, but it does also give them other rights because as I often say during my conversations with landowners, uh, the tribe and the landowners do not always see eye to eye as well. So once you bring them in, they're in. Uh, and so it is a, it's a tough, 
tough decision to make. Um, we're getting at the end. Uh, Chad, would you like to take any time to uh, maybe wrap up or address any thing that uh, you felt didn't get covered well? Uh, no, I, maybe maybe one thing since you yes. asked. <laughs> um, I, I think it is an important point that, that Greg made. You know, our services, when we're talking about the income approach and we're talking about throughput based analysis and build around analysis, you know, that that's sort of a secondary valuation. And it's, you know, it's what we call the negotiated value. But, you know, as a lot of landowners, as, as Greg mentioned, you do all have to get this this use path based uh, appraisal completed. So that that, you know, sets the minimum bar. And then if you or the tribe are able to negotiate above that, you know, based on on what my firm or similar firms are telling you, you know, then then you can go higher technically. But you still have to, to have that bar. So it. it Hiring us would not necessarily mean that you don't have to get the appraisal, um, et cetera. I think that's that's an important point, and, I, and it should be driven home a little bit more. Thank you. Well, we have surpassed uh, an hour, our uh, seven o'clock time frame. Uh, Greg, any last words? Um, I, I think based on conversations I have had with applicants, um, I think they will generally be willing to negotiate with landowners above that appraised value. They may not double that value, but the conversations that I've had said, they're willing to, to work with you and, and try to reach a number that you can both agree on. Um, they recognize that the tribes have a unique ability that you as individual landowners don't have and they're willing to to negotiate um i won't speculate as to how much above in terms of a percentage but of all of the applicants that i have talked to i think there's only been one or two who have told me no we will only pay the appraised value and even when they say that there's still opportunities there for the landowners to squeeze them for a little bit more so remember that you as a landowner always have the ability to negotiate wonderful thank you both um i'd like to thank greg and chad for making time this evening for all of us and for you too the audience for attending um so uh, in the next couple of days, uh, we will be sending out a survey to get your feedback on this town hall and the process. Please take a few brief minutes to fulfill that. It helps us provide the topics that are important to you as landowners. It also helps to uh, improve the process overall. Uh, and for one last reminder, I would also suggest that in August, or no, not August, uh, September 28th is going to take a look at agricultural leasing. So uh, next month in September, uh, the topic of the month is agricultural leasing. But if you fill out the survey, we can take a look at what we can do beginning the new year. So again, thank you both. And thank you audience for coming this evening. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>